I hate to tell you this, but there seems to be some confusion on the internet, specifically about keeping snakes. I don't know if there's anybody else on the internet that's confused about other subjects, but I'm here to help clear up the snake keeping corner of the internet. Hey, you should see the politics side of the internet because- Kent, no. <laughs> Welcome to The Green Room, I'm Bob Bledsoe. This Super Dwarf retake is Echo. And in this episode, I'm gonna cover seven things that I've heard either often or recently from snake keepers. So it's not gonna be myths that people spread about snakes, like your snake is sizing you up. Which they are. Or that snakes chase you. They do that. Or that they'll sting you with your tongue. It's worse than a freaking hornet. Kent, I know that you're trying to mutter under your breath, but I think the microphone is picking that up. Oh dang, sorry. Okay, so some of these are things that I've heard recently from new keepers. Some of it is just some confusion. And there's one thing that uh, just made it into this video because I was having a conversation about it while I was writing this video. So here we go. You go have an adventure. Number one, putting ball pythons in an area together to explore is bad because they'll fight or because I heard cohabbing is bad. They won't fight. Ball pythons don't fight. I do have some rules with some of my snakes, uh, like I don't allow adult males out because I don't want male combat, but that's still not like a fight, like, like biting. But I hear this one a lot because I post videos of my snakes free roaming on TikTok and, and Instagram and YouTube and such. And, and people either wonder, you know, they'll say, oh, I have two ball pythons, but I'm afraid to, to put them together because I'm afraid they'll fight. How did you introduce them? You just put them in a spot. Like there's, there's no, it's not like introducing dogs. It's fine. Ball pythons get along just fine together. And as for cohabbing, this is just somebody that doesn't understand uh, what cohabbing is. They've heard about it on the internet. And uh, what, what cohabbing is, is having two snakes live in the same area, the same uh, enclosure. And the reason that that is bad for uh, many p species of snake, not all, but many species of snake, is that they will compete for resources and over time it creates a lot of stress for the snake. But roaming around with other snakes in the area is not a problem at all for ball pythons. So you can do that. I have videos on how to safely free roam snakes. Uh, feel free to check those out and um, see how to do it safely because you could do it very unsafely too. But uh, the problem is not that your ball pythons are going to fight. That's not the issue. Number two, I bought a ball python from a breeder and I just found out that one of its parents has the spider morph. And now I'm freaking out because I think my snake is going to have a wobble. I'm not going to dive too deep into the spider morph, but basically that particular gene comes with an inner ear problem that causes the snake to potentially have a wobble or in bad cases, corkscrewing. Most snakes are, are just fine with the spider gene, but with some it causes more severe problems. But here's the thing. If your snake is not a spider morph, it's not going to have an inner ear problem caused by the spider morph. The inspector's dad was a spider, but he didn't get the genes, so he doesn't have a wobble. He is Mr. Cranky Pants, though, mainly because he wants to be underground in his cage. So I'm going to put him back in there. Here, buddy. I'm going to go back. Echo, you relax. You go back in there. Echo, you calm down. Stop it. Why? I'm not... This is not feeding. Why do you think I'm feeding right now? Why are you so crazy? Number three. Veterinarians don't know snakes. Now, I've mentioned this one before, but it's important to mention again. Uh, when somebody goes to veterinary school, there are multiple paths that they can take. And one of those paths is exotics. And some schools even have a reptile specialty within exotics. So you probably don't want to bring your snake to the same vet that neutered your dog. But if your animal has a health problem, it's totally appropriate to take them to an exotic vet. Exotic vets are trained in the medical diagnosis and treatment of exotic animals and that includes snakes. What they're not trained in is the specific husbandry requirements of every reptile on the planet. I see a lot of people say that they went to a vet and they got some advice from the vet on husbandry that they know to be not true. So they just write that vet off as a quack. Don't do that. You're not paying them for husbandry advice. You're paying them to medically diagnose and treat your animal. And by the way, some of that advice could be very good because they do know general husbandry stuff, so they could give you some great husbandry advice. But it's just not what you're paying them for. So my point is, please don't storm out of your dog and cat clinic and jump on a Facebook group and say that vets don't know snakes. Because exotic vets do, and you should definitely bring your snake to one 
if you think they might be having a health problem. Let me say what just happened when the camera was off while we scroll the horde of keepers here over on patreon.com slash greenroompythons. Echo was in ultra food mode and I couldn't figure out why and I walked by the cage and she struck at me and then I remembered the reason is that I had a snake who left a rodent in their cage and I found it this morning. I forgot to check on them before I went to bed last night to make sure he ate it. And uh, so I had it out this morning and she can smell that rodent. So of course she's in food mode. So the big piece of wood that she was sitting in, I just picked it up and put it back in her cage. Cause I don't need snakes striking at me while I'm trying to shoot a video. Anyway, you guys know that Discord and Patreon are separate things, right? Patreon is a place that you can go and become a member and get extra content and uh, gifts and things like that from me. Um, that's a great community over there. Discord is a separate thing where you can join for free. You actually have Patreon benefits if you're on Patreon and jump on Discord also. But Discord is a great place to get advice and get good information uh, from experienced keepers. We have a lot of experienced keepers on there. We have a whole channel on Discord that's just snake questions, husbandry questions, things like that. So uh, feel free to jump on there. And if you want to support the channel, Hop on Patreon and uh, become a member of the Horde of Keepers. Thanks uh, to all these people. And special thanks, as always, to our channel sponsors, Black Box Cages, Lane Labs, and Gray Family Snakes. Check out those discount codes. Number four, winter is coming, so my ball python is going to go off food or go into breeding mode or go into brumation. There's all kinds of versions of that that I hear. Let's talk about brumation first. Pythons don't brumate. Uh, brumation is basically hibernation for reptiles that live in cooler climates. So the rattlesnakes and alligator lizards that are around where I live in Southern California go underground and brumate for the winter. Pythons don't do that because they live in warmer climates. Snakes and lizards that are from areas closer to the equator aren't going to brumate because it never gets cold enough for them to do that. So when you look at areas that pythons are from, uh, in fact, when you look at the areas of the world the pythons are from, wait, what am I doing? No, let's try <laughs> the wrong side of the earth. Where are we? Here, pythons are from here, and it doesn't get that cold. This is a great visual explanation, Bob. Well done. At least I didn't have it upside down. Where'd the rubber band go? Kada, what did you do with my rubber band? Oh, there it is can't have a map without a rubber band. As for just changes in your snake's behavior because it's winter, as long as you keep your snake indoors, that shouldn't really be a thing. Your snake's cage, the environment in your snake's cage, shouldn't change just because the weather is different outside. Now, we know that snakes do feel barometric pressure and that uh, helps sometimes in breeding season, but that's during a storm. The barometric pressure goes, I guess, up during a storm. Maybe it's down. I don't know. Somebody, a meteorologist put in the comments what it is. I think it goes up though. And they can feel that, but storms happen all year long. So it's not, it's not like winter time versus summertime. And you know, snakes do kind of have their own annual cycle that they'll get on. Breeders talk about that they start breeding in November. You'll hear breeders say, well, it's November and I'm starting to pair up my animals, but that's just because they choose to do it that time of year. I've, I pair up animals all year round and they tend to get on the same cycle that they were on last time they were paired. So for pet ball pythons, the season in Africa or the season outside your house should have no effect on the snake. The weather maybe though, with the barometric pressure. Now here's another one that I've talked about before, but I see it all the time in the Facebook groups. Don't take your snake outside because you could pick up snake mites. Snake mites are specific to snakes. It's going to be highly unlikely that there's going to be a random snake mite just in your lawn. You're more likely to pick up a tick, potentially, if you live in an area that's just infested with ticks. So like if you have to check your dog or your children regularly when they come inside, if you are just in the habit of checking them for ticks, you live in that part of the south uh, or maybe the north too. Then, then maybe you would also check your snake for ticks if you, you know, if you went outside, but you would see them. I think because people hear all the time that you've got to sanitize anything or bake it or whatever, if you bring a, if you bring a piece of wood in from outside, you got to really make sure that it's clean. Uh, because of that, people get the idea that snakes uh, will just keel over if they run into anything in the outdoors. And that's not the case. It's just that if we're putting something in the snake's home that they, that, that's going to be sitting next to the snake at all times, 
you want to make sure that it's clean, that it's free of bugs and things like that. But if a snake is just slithering around outside, snakes are very resilient. They're going to be just fine. A valid concern, though, is if you're putting your snake in an area that's been treated with any chemicals, like chemical fertilizer or pesticide or weed killer, something like that. You know how a snake can easily pick up mites, though? Is if you bring them with you to a reptile show. Don't do that. Right, Kata? You don't need mites. We'd see them all over you if you had mites. We'd see them right away, wouldn't we? All right, we're putting you back. Do you want to crawl? Do you want to stay out here? Here, you can be on the couch. How about that? Look at that. You're on your own. I think we should cut to Kent's corner. This one is helpful. Hey, I'm always up for helpful information. Hi, and welcome to Kent's corner. The best thing you've ever seen. I get letters from viewers all the time saying, "Hi, Kent. I'm a huge fan of your knowledge. I just bought a new snake, and I'm wondering how many ways might it murder me." That's a freaking great question. 27. Squeezing. Poison. Venom. Stabbing. Explosions. Psychological games. Gang wars. Slap fights. Okay, that's probably enough. Can't you get letters, like in the mailbox? Hmm? Let me see one. Oh, I, th I threw them all away. Okay, well, since you get them all the time, just bring the next one in. It'll probably come in the next day or two, right? Yes, fine. Ladies and gentlemen, please send your letters to the address on the screen and I will add them to my other letters that I get all the time. And throw into the trash. I won't! Well, as promised, that was helpful and definitely not a waste of time. Thanks, Kent. Number six, rodent sizes. Now, this is going to be different than what I think you are expecting me to talk about. Uh, but this is when a keeper learns the general rules and they understand how to measure and figure out how big of a rodent to feed their snake. They will absolutely obsess over whether the rodent is slightly too small or slightly too big. I think it's important to keep in mind that these snakes live out in the wild. And in the wild, they get whatever comes along. And sometimes that's a really big meal that's going to put them out of commission for a couple weeks while they digest. And sometimes it's a little tiny meal and they'll be looking for another one right away. Uh, sometimes a ball python will crawl into a rodent den that has a bunch of small rodents in there and they'll eat a whole bunch at once. All those scenarios work in getting nourishment into this snake, getting something in their belly. So as keepers, we try to give them the ideal size. We want to give them something that's not going to tax their body too much, and uh, we want to give them enough food that's healthy for them. We talk about feeding one appropriately sized food item, which is a great way to go. Uh, but if you're out of smalls and you have a couple of weans, I, you know, I feed, I feed raw in here small rats, but if I had a couple weans that I need to get rid of, two weaned rats, uh, that equals about a small. So I might give him two. It's not ideal, but it's just one meal. If I give something that's a little bit bigger to a younger snake, let's say it's 25% larger than the thickest part of their body, they're going to be able to handle that. It'll be fine. I'm just going to give them extra time to digest. It's not that big of a deal. You're not going to kill your snake that way. And please remember, I'm talking about people who already understand the rules. They, they, know, they know the rules of how to size up your snake's meal. If you don't know the rules, I have videos on that. I will give this one caveat because a lot of people don't learn this little aspect of, of the rules. And that is that the rules you've learned about sizing your prey don't apply to adult snakes. They apply to your younger snakes. I give Ron a small rat uh, every two weeks and a small rat is much thinner than the thickest part of his body. And certainly with my big fat females that are twice the size of Ron, they're getting medium rats. They're not even getting large rats. And a rabbit with a couple of my snakes, a, a rabbit would be the size of the thickest part of their body. They're not getting anything nearly that size. Uh, so that's the one caveat. As your snake gets bigger, you don't have to size your your rodents up to the thickest part of their body. It's going to be smaller. F you know, figure if you have an adult male, give them a small. If you have an adult female, give them a medium. My point is that once you understand the basic rules, don't spend a ton of time stressing over it. Your snake's going to be fine. I'm bringing Kata back for this one because it's appropriate. Number seven is uh, confusion that I want to clear up that is only in this video because I was explaining it to my friend Amy while I was writing this video and it made it in. Uh, this is a good one for a lot of people that don't understand. T positive and T negative albino. Uh, now, first of all, when people see Kata, guess what their first question to me is? Did you guess it? You guessed it, didn't you? Well done. Yeah. Uh, they ask if she's albino. She's not. She's leucistic. We're not even going to talk about leucistic, but the reason she's not albino is that albino 
pulls out melanin and melanin is only one aspect of colors and patterns. So an albino snake usually has a ton of pattern. They're just yellow and they have pink eyes oftentimes, but not always. And let's talk about that. I'm going to put her not even back. I'm going to put her down. I'm going to go back where you were, babes. We have T positive and T negative albino in a number of different species of snake. And ball python people hear those words usually referring to other species of, of snake. And so that's why a lot of times people don't know what it means. But we actually have T positive and T negative in ball pythons as well. We just don't use those terms and that's why you don't hear it a lot. My boa here, Handsome Dan, is a T positive albino. The T stands for tyrosinase. And tyrosinase is one of many proteins that remove melanin from a snake. So uh, Handsome Dan being T positive means that he has tyrosinase. He doesn't have a lot of the other proteins that remove the blacks and the browns. Uh, that's, that's what melanin does. It, it puts blacks and browns in snakes. So, uh, handsome Dan doesn't have any black really. He might have some speckles here and there. Uh, but he's got kind of a caramel color. And if you notice his eyes aren't pink. So T positive albinos, I can't tell if it's focusing on him or not. T positive albinos don't have pink eyes and they do still have some browns and possibly some blacks. He's got speckles that look black to me, but maybe they're dark brown. But anyway, he would be a much darker snake in a different color if he was normal, if he wasn't a T-positive albino. A T-negative albino is just what people usually call regular albino. That's an albino that has all the proteins, including tyrosinase, that are removed from the snake and it takes out all their melanin, so you end up with a yellow snake. But sometimes tyrosinase stays in there uh, in certain albino uh, morphs and so we get a snake like this now in ball pythons we have t positive and t negative albinos t negative albino is just your regular albino you see these snakes with pink eyes and they look great in different combos but there's also t positive we just don't call it that caramel albino is one that you don't see very often because uh, breeders typically don't breed caramels anymore because they come with some genetic problems but molly malone here is a T-positive albino also. We just call it Ultramel because in the ball python world, we like to be fancy about it. But Ultramel is a T-positive albino morph. She's real pretty, huh? So she's got all the proteins that are taking away the blacks and a lot of the browns, and you get this nice caramel-y color. Same with caramel albino, you get that, that similar color also. And, uh, even though she is technically albino, she doesn't have pink eyes. So Molly Malone, a ball python, and Handsome Dan, a boa, are both T-positive albinos. I hope that cleared up a few things. And if you already knew all of this, well, aren't you Mr. Fancy Brains? Or Mrs., you know. Put down in the comments how fancy your brains are. <laughs>